Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examinations perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu daily edition of today. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on the screen and the time stamping of the film has been provided in the description box below. So now let us begin our discussion. This first topic is from the the Hindu daily edition of date 25th December. at that particular date on the occasion of the christmas because we had a holiday but this topic was very relevant and that is why we are taking this particular topic in today's session the other topics which are to be discussed in today's session will be from today's the hindu daily edition as well this topic is in relation to the great barrier reef that is found on the eastern coast of australia the great barrier reef is nothing but a coral reef now corals what are corals Now these are one of the most fascinating as well as beautiful features which are found beneath the sea surface. They not just have their aesthetic importance but they also have a very high economic as well as ecological significances. That is why in today's session we are going to learn about all the possible dimensions related to the coral reefs. However, the immediate context of this very news article is that recently the scientists who were working on the Australia's Great Barrier Reef have successfully tried a new method for freezing and storing the coral larva. Now this method is based on basically the principles of cryogenics that is at very low temperatures at around minus 200 degrees Celsius these coral larvas will be stored. The technology which is used in this very storing process is the cryo mesh technology. the cryo mesh was previously trialed on smaller and larger varieties of the hawaiian corals but now the scientists are planning to replicate at the great barrier reef and as we all know that great barrier reef has suffered four bleaching events in the last 7 years including the first ever bleach during a la nina phenomena which typically brings the cooler temperatures as far as the syllabus is concerned this topic falls under the general studies paper 3 section of environment and the micro section which mentions conservation environmental pollution and degradation so in this very regard today we are going to discuss about the basics of the coral reefs what are the factors which are responsible for their formation their global distribution their significance what exactly do we mean by coral bleaching and what are the various factors that is local as well as global factors which influence the mass deaths of corals so now let us begin our discussion in detail so first of all we need to understand that what are corals and what are coral reefs now corals are the marine invertebrate animals keep this thing in mind that corals are the animals and these animals are the lime secreting organism that is their skeletal remains do secrete the calcium carbonate that is the lime so corals are the animals that is invertebrate they do not have their spinal cords and what happens is that initially the polyp grows over a particular area there are certain conditions responsible for this but if those conditions are met there are several polyps which clog together which come together and form the groupings so that is why polyp 1 polyp 2 polyp 3 and hence several polyps come together and this colony of polyps is known as the corals so now corals are of two types that is hard corals as well as soft corals the hard corals are those corals which extract the calcium carbonate from the sea water because the sea water also contains certain amount of calcium carbonate and from those water these are extracted to build the rocks these are the hard corals and that is why because they are extracting the calcium carbonate and they are laying the foundation to build the coral reefs they are also known as the engineers of the coral ecosystem on the other hand the soft corals live on the coral reefs which are formed by these hard corals moreover they also secrete their own calcium carbonate from the dead remains of their skeleton body so corals are the animals and the reefs are the rock structures which are formed out of the accumulation and compaction of the calcium carbonate produced by the corals or extracted by these corals so i hope the coral reefs are clear to you corals are the animals and reefs are the rock structures formed out of them now there are certain favorable conditions which help in coral formation 
First of all, warm waters. The temperature of the waters in which the corals can be formed ranges on an average around 23 degrees Celsius to 29 degrees Celsius. They are also found within the thermal range starting from 20 degrees Celsius up to 32 degrees Celsius. But it is to be understood here that corals are not the urethermal species, rather they are stenothermal species. What do you mean by stenothermal species? That they can tolerate very low level of temperature changes. If there are slight changes in the temperature, then there can be an event of mass coral deaths. So, warm water is the first criteria for them to form. The second important criteria is the shallow waters. Now, there is a simple logic for it because if the waters are very deep, then sunlight will not be able to penetrate up to certain depths. But if the waters are shallow, then only the sunlight can penetrate up to the sea base and that is why the temperature of the water in shallow areas will remain warm that is within this particular range. So if you need to have warm waters, obviously you need to have shallow waters as well. The third important thing is clear waters. Now because what happens is that because of the excessive sedimentation or presence of dust particles or molecules in the waters, they can clog the mouth of the corals and that is how the corals will begin to die. So that is why clear waters are required and those waters should be in between between the purely fresh waters as well as purely saline waters. Excessively fresh or excessively saline waters both are harmful for corals. The next important criteria is the pollution levels. Again, if we are having high number of pollutants or if we are having toxic chemicals in the seawater, these chemicals can hinder the sunlight to reach up to the sea surface and that is why the water will not be warmed and hence the corals will die. And the last important factor is the wildlife population. Now the corals live in a marine ecosystem and the ecosystem thrives upon the well strengthened and sustainable food web which exists over there. So that is why if we are having a high amount of biological diversity that is wildlife population in that particular area that will help to keep a check on the prey population and that is how they can support the corals to grow. So these are the five favorable conditions which influence the coral formations. Now if we have to look at the global distribution of the corals, you just have to think that which are those regions whereby these five conditions are fulfilled and most importantly these natural factors that is warm, shallow and clear waters. So now let us look at the global distribution of the corals. Obviously because we require the warm water and hence the coral formation will take place in the tropical area. Second because we require shallow waters hence the corals will form mainly across the coast that is the continental shelf areas. So that is why most of the corals are formed along the coast of India in the southeast Asian region with areas lying in the tropical region and in the eastern coast of Australia we have already known that great barrier reef is formed. Similarly in the Caribbean waters along the coast of the Central America for example the areas of Honduras, Panama etc we find coral reefs. Similarly in the coasts of Brazil we also find them. But again the corals will not be found in the deep ocean waters and hence Despite this region being tropical in nature, there are no corals here. So the conditions which are responsible for the coral formation, if you apply those conditions and you try to identify that which are those areas which fulfill those conditions, you will be able to identify that where the coral reefs are formed. In this very line next comes why the coral reefs are so much significant. Why now and then several environmentalists raise their voices in order to preserve and conserve this ecosystem. First and the foremost thing is their ecological significance that is the biodiversity which it supports. Now it is estimated that out of the total areas of the ocean waters, the area in which the coral ecosystem thrives is just around 1%. But this 1% of that total area sustains 25% of the marine population, marine diversity. So that means just 1% of this area 
supports 25% of the biodiversity of the marine waters. Second comes the economic significance that is their huge potential of tourism as well as employment generation. For example, let's take only the case of Australia. In just one country, the coral ecosystem boosts around $4.6 billion of economy and that is just on the basis of tourism. Just the tourism industry which derives its revenue from the coral ecosystem is pegged at $4.6 billion and this supports around 60,000 of the employment avenues as well. The third important thing is the fishing. Most of the areas in which the coral lives, they are also known for their fishing industries. The reason? Because we have discussed that corals are the areas where there are huge biological diversity and that is why the fishes also flourish. In these areas, we also have planktons. So that is why again, the planktons are very favorable for the fishes to grow. Next, there is geomorphic significance also. For example, what happens is, let's say this is India and here we are having the coral reefs. So whenever the cyclones will try to hit this particular area or whenever the sea waves will try to breach this area, we have a rock structure which will hinder their free movement and hence they can protect the coastal erosion in these areas. They can protect the marine flood waters to enter into the land and hence they can in turn reduce the loss of life as well as property. So these are multi-dimensional significance that is ecological significance, economic significance, geomorphic significance. They are also important for human health as well and also the recreational activities. But nowadays, because of the various anthropogenic activities, there is a thing which is known as the coral bleaching. Now coral bleaching is taking place. Now what exactly is the coral bleaching? Now let us understand this particular concept from this diagram. Now there is a symbiotic relationship between the corals as well as the algae species known as zooxanthellae. So the areas where the healthy corals are found they will be the areas which were having this symbiotic mutual relationship that is the corals as well as algae is present over there. But then because of certain factors, we find stressed coral ecosystem whereby the algae leaves this coral ecosystem and now the corals are by their own. And because of the leaving of these algae, there is a discoloration of the corals. And this discoloration that is you can see here from these colors, the corals now have become white. So this discoloration of the coral is known as bleaching of the coral. Now this coral bleaching can be because of various natural as well as human factors. So let us see that what are the local as well as the global threats which are deteriorating the quality of the coral ecosystem across the world. First we will see the local threats. Now. There can be a physical damage or destruction of the corals. This can be on account of the coastal developmental activities like dredging, querying. Then there are several excessive economic activities, unsustainable practices, for example, destructive fishing practices. Then there are also misuses of the tourism or the recreational activities. For example, when the tourists travel in the lagoon lakes in the coral ecosystem, they physically touch or remove certain coral species. So that is how the physical damage or the destruction can lead to alteration of the coral ecosystem. Second is the excessive sedimentation. This point we have already discussed that because of the presence of various sediments or the pollutants, there can be the clogging of the mouths of the coral polyps. And if their mouths are clogged, then eventually they will die. Third is the excessive nutrients. Now, despite the fact that nutrient rich water is beneficial for the coral but when there are excessive nutrients they lead to increase in the population of the algae and once the population of the algae increase there is a disturbance in the entire food ecosystem of that particular area and hence the corals will die. Similarly the presence of pathogens or the toxic substances can introduce various coral diseases for example white band disease or the black band disease etc. Then presence of the trash or the microplastic can block the sunlight to reach to the corals 
and then these microplastic can also enter into the digestive systems of corals fishes etc then because of the overfishing we can understand that there will be a disturbance in the food web and similarly other human activities for example the coral harvesting for trade as well as jewelry also alter or rather disturb the coral ecosystem so these are the local factors that is in certain areas either this factor would be dominant or let's say this factor is dominant or the combination of these factors will be dominant but then there are global factors also that is those phenomena which are occurring worldwide and therefore they are not region specific rather they are disturbing the coral ecosystem of the whole globe for example on account of the release of greenhouse gases and the resultant global warming effect we all know that there is a significant rise in the ocean temperature now this rise in the ocean temperature is very much detrimental for the algae population and that is how the algae start leaving those areas there is a huge algae loss and as we have discussed that because algae and corals have a symbiotic mutual relationship even if one component is removed from that system the other component will eventually die so that is why if there is an algae loss there will be the coral bleaching and mass deaths similarly if there are changes in the ocean chemistry for example let us assume that ocean acidification is on rise now because of the ocean acidification the ph levels will get altered and hence it can in turn affect the entire marine ecosystem and thus can lead to the bleaching events so now let us see with some examples of the dead corals here see these are the dead corals which are found on the beaches of the ramnagar in the neel islands of andaman these are certain examples of the finger corals which have become dead so there are two primary reasons for this the first reason is the that this region still sustains the impact of the tsunami which all of us know and the second important reason is that this area experiences high tides and low tides every day so the long periods of exceptionally low tides leave shallow water corals head exposed damaging the reefs the amounts of the damage depends on the time of the day and the weather conditions coral exposed during daylight hours are subject to the most uv radiations which can overheat and dry out the coral tissues so these are certain threats which are responsible for the coral destructions the local as well as the global threats now let us revise this topic in brief once again so initially we discussed that what do we exactly mean by corals what are coral reefs and what are different types of corals that is the hard corals as well as soft corals then we saw that which are those favorable conditions which lead to coral formation that is the warm waters shallow waters clear waters lack of pollution and presence of wildlife population and then we saw the global distribution of the coral ecosystem across the world and here we learned that the coral formation takes place in the shallow areas of the tropical waters then coming to the significance we saw that there are ecological economic geomorphic as well as the health significance in this line we learned about the phenomena of the coral bleaching and in the end we discussed that there are certain local threats which operate in a particular area and then there are certain global threats which operate throughout the globe and these factors are leading to the destruction of the coral ecosystem now this news article has appeared in today's the hindu daily edition at page number 8 This topic has basically appeared in today's editorial section and the topic reads friendly neighbors. You must have rightly guessed that this topic talks about India and its neighborhood relations and that is why this topic is mainly relevant from the general studies mains paper 2 perspective because it mentions international relations as its important section. Now despite the fact that the immediate context of this very topic is in relation to the Maldives only but in today's session we will not restrict ourselves to the Maldives. because we are going to discuss the larger theme around which this topic finds relevance and a the larger theme is the importance or the relevance of small island countries which are there in the indian ocean for us so there are several islands in the indian ocean some of the important islands for example sri lanka maldives diego garcia coco seychelles madagascar and scotra are shown in the screen there are other islands as well 
and if you go by the recent year geopolitics you will witness that several countries including india are changing their foreign policy and are more focusing towards the ocean regions and that is why the indo pacific strategy for india gains its importance right and moreover if you closely analyze the world map there are several island nations in indian ocean and atlantic as well as in pacific ocean which are controlled by those countries which are located far away so why is this what is the importance of such small island countries for larger nations they do not have a very high population their economy is not very strong they do not contribute much to the global gdp they do not have very high military capabilities so what are exactly those things which make these island countries important for the larger countries like india so in this backdrop today we will discuss the importance of these islands for india and moreover not only for india even india is also important for all these island countries and that is why because of this very fact recently country like sri lanka and maldives have started india first policy now this india first policy is complementary to india's neighborhood first policy so this complementarity shows that there is a mutual beneficial relationship between india as well as other small island countries in indian ocean so let us analyze these very things first of all we will talk about economy now yes this is a fact that these small island countries do not contribute much to global gdp but despite this fact they are very important for indian exports for example india can export several pharmaceutical products to countries like madagascar and seychelles india further exports engineering goods to sri lanka as well as maldives India has also exported certain defense products to countries like Maldives so that is why when it comes to the indian exports these countries are very important second most important dimension of their importance is their strategic importance for example let us see the location of skotra now this is located at the mouth of strait babal mandab which connects the mediterranean sea swiss canal to the indian ocean now if india has a strong military or dominant presence let's say in this particular region that means that india has a greater dominance of this very area also but on the contrary if india does not has a strong presence in this particular thing then we can understand that a lot of cargo import or exports which occurs through this very region can be compromised this area is also highly vulnerable to the maritime piracy so that is why there are certain choke points along which there are certain small island countries which have a very high strategic importance another similar example can be of cocos island which is located in close proximity to the strait of malacca and we all know that this strait of malacca is an important passage when it come to the geopolitics between india and china The third important dimension of their importance comes from the ecological perspective. Now all these island countries are more or less located in the tropical region and because of this all these islands bear huge biodiversity in terms of corals, fishes, plankton as well as other marine life. And this helps to preserve the pristine environment of the Indian Ocean. which also has a long term effect in tackling the climate change next important component is the disaster management now this entire region is highly vulnerable to certain disasters for example they are vulnerable to cyclones earthquakes as well as tsunamis and indian coastal area is also highly vulnerable to this so that is why india as well as all of these countries require a close collaboration and cooperation when it comes to disaster management within this indian ocean region next comes the cultural angle the people to people contact or the cultural ties which india shares with lot of these countries are also very important for example there is a very close cultural tie when it comes to the india sri lanka relation an epic text ramayana also proves this similarly in countries like madagascar seychelles 
Maldives, there are several people who are descendants of Indian origin. So that is why there is a huge people to people connect between these countries. And last but not the least point is related to the exclusive economic zone. You can club this point with this larger economic perspective also. However, I have taken this point as separate because it requires a separate mention for you people. Now these islands are scattered across different locations in Indian oceans. So when India, for example, has a closer ties, let's say with Diago Garcia, so India also gets certain control over the exclusive economic zone along the coasts of Diago Garcia. So this is one of the most important factor because of which several countries try to either extend their control, direct control over certain island countries or they try to establish close relations with those countries. Because by the international law, all the important elements which lies in the exclusive economic zone of Diego Garcia comes under the control of that very country. And we all know that in recent times, the concept of blue economy is gaining huge prominence. For example, we are all aware about the metallic nodules and their huge potential when it comes to the energy security. So this is one of the most pressing and important reason why India as well as several other countries try to establish their relationship with these small island countries. Further, despite the fact that whether any country is small or large, no matter how much population it has, but every country has one vote when it comes to the United Nations. So that is why whenever there is a voting, so obviously all these countries will also be having one vote each. And if India wants certain proposals to be passed in United Nations, so obviously it will require the support of all these countries as well. So these are multidimensional merits or benefits or the importance of these small island countries for India. And that is why through various initiatives, for example, Indo-Pacific Strategy, Indian Ocean Rim Association, as well as several bilateral ties, India is trying to establish close relationships with all these countries. For example, India recently announced $500 million package for Greater Malay Connectivity Project. And according to experts, this project is larger in scale than the china Maldives Friendship Bridge. India is also building the logistics support facilities at the remote Agalega Islands in Mauritius as part of the agreement signed between both the countries. Similarly, India and Seychelles have agreed for a joint project on the Assumption Islands and also to enhance the defense and maritime security cooperation with $100 million line of credit. Despite all these steps, there are certain challenges also. And the first and the most important challenge is rivalry for the natural resources. So as we have already discussed that because the territory along the coast of all these small island countries are very important when it comes to the strategic or economic perspective. So there is a sort of rat race going among various larger countries to gain control over these small island countries. And that is why countries like China, US, European Union, etc. are struggling to gain the control. They are having a virtual rivalry to control the natural resources which are found in these small island countries. The second important challenge is the growing religious fanaticism. Now because these small island countries are not connected to the larger mainlands, so that is why they are relatively isolated. And that is why people are not aware sometimes about the things which are happening across the globe. Yes, there is digital connectivity and we are living in the era of internet connection, but still the reality is that not every corner of the world or not every section of the population has that internet connection. And that is why when the certain population or the section of population is living a restricted life, so there are high chances that they can be manipulated. And that is why the religious fanaticism is growing in some of these small island countries. Further, the security issue like terrorism and the nuclear threats are also increasing. Along with this, the organized crime is also taking roots in these countries. For example, there are well-established drug cartels in Sri Lanka, 
Mauritius as well as Scotra. And last challenge is the underdevelopment of these countries, which basically forms the root cause of several issues like poverty, hunger, lawlessness, etc. So these are certain challenges which these small island countries face and that is why these challenges are also important for India because any challenge which is there for any of our neighboring country is also a challenge for us. Now this news article has appeared at page number 3. This topic is mainly relevant from the history section or the culture section when it comes to the CSE examination. The topic reads, Karnataka carves out a separate category for Veer Shavas and Vokaligas. So as far as the immediate context is concerned, this news is important because these two sects that is Veer Shavites as well as Vokaligas have been given a separate category status within the overall OBC quota. So this has to do with reservation. However, from our examinations perspective, we need to be aware about certain key historical facts regarding the Veer Shavs as well as Vokaligas. So that is why in today's session, we will be discussing with these two things. First, we will discuss about the Veer Shavs. So this sect was founded by Basava and this person was the Prime Minister during the reign of Kalachuri dynasty and specifically during the King Bijala I in Karnataka. So Basava was the person who was the Prime Minister of Bijala who founded this particular sect known as Veer Shavs. They are also known as the Lingayat sects. The basic principles which Basava advocated was equality of all the human beings irrespective of their caste, gender, sect, religion, etc. Further, he also advocated that all the forms of manual labor are equally important. He also considered wearing of Ishtling. Ishtling basically is a necklace with a pendant that contains the small Shiva Ling. So he considered wearing of Ishtling as an important practice for the Veer Shavs or the Lingayats. And that is why Baswa is also known by the name Ishtling. So there are certain key facts which are related to Lingayatism or the Veer Shavism. So you might have seen the previous year questions in the UPSC prelims examination whereby they ask certain key terminologies which are there in the history or the culture section that is from the ancient or the medieval history. So that is why here also there are certain key terminologies which are associated with Lingayats. First is the Anubhav Mantapa. Now this Anubhav Mantapa was the first parliament in the history of mankind ever organized. So remember this particular word. Now because we are dealing with the historical topics, so obviously most of the things are factual in nature and that is why you have to memorize them. Anubhav Mantapa, this you can relate with a Hindi word that is Mandap and you can connect it with some association of the people which is also known as the parliament. Now all the recordings of this parliamentary proceedings or the Anubhav Mantapa were recorded in the form of Vachan literature. Now Vachan in Hindi is related to the Vakya that is speak. So whatever was spoken in this Anubhav Mantapa, it was recorded in the form of Vachan literature. Next important term is Kayaka. Now Kayaka denotes the manual labor. So Kayaka meant that every person has to work for his or her living. And that has to be with the divine mindset, that is the mind which is free from corruption, which is free from any ill will. So that is why Kayaka denotes working for the survival with the divine mindset. And then all the earnings which you get by working for your survival, a part of that earning must be given for the welfare of the poor which were known as Dasuha. Again an important term. Now this concept is very much common across various religions as well as sects. That is whatever you earn, a part of that money must be given for the welfare of the poor people. The followers of these Lingayat beliefs were also known as Sharanas and the preachers of this Lingayat faith were known as Jangamas. So again I am repeating this thing. Founder of the Veer Shev was Basava. 
he was the prime minister during kalachuri dynasty during the kingship of bejala 1 basava advocated equality and also considered wearing of ist ling as an important practice anubhav mantapa related to the first parliament vachan literature were the recordings of anubhav mantapa kayaka was the work which you do for your survival the suha was the part of that total earning which you give to the poor people shranas are the common followers of lingayat beliefs and jangamas are the preachers of the lingayat faith now come to vokaligas now these vokaligas are primarily located in the southern karnataka region especially during the mysore dynasty so by profession they were warriors as well as cultivators actually this word vokaligas has been made out of a word known as voku voku is a terminology related to the grain cultivators so that is why they were warriors as well as cultivators and because they were also warriors so they had a huge dominance in the old mysore kingdom dominance in terms of money in terms of power in terms of politics as well as in terms of demography an important fact is that kempe gora 1 who was the founder of bangalore was a member of this very community they have produced many princely families like wadiyars of mysore however the progress in the sphere of general education was gradual this prompted the vokaliga community's leaders to organize an association which was supported by then diwan of mysore vp madhava rao and this association was formed finally in 1906 by the name vokaligar sangh an important word that is vokaligar sangh formed in 1906 so these were certain key facts from the historical perspective related to the veer shafs as well as vokaligas now moving towards the last topic this topic has appeared at page number 7 though this topic is a state specific news but such river water disputes are very common when it comes to the upsc prelims examination that is why you need to be aware about all the major river water disputes which are there in india between different states this river water dispute is basically related to the kalasa banduri project and is mainly between the states of karnataka as well as goa the river in conflict is mandavi river this mandavi river is also known as the mahadai river now with the help of this diagram we will try to understand that what is the basic dispute now this is the region of karnataka the dark portion is the karnataka region and the lighter one is the goa region this is the mahadai river also known as mandavi river it originates from karnataka and goes in goa mandavi and zuari these are the two main rivers in the state of goa which fulfills all the water related needs of the state of goa but here obviously we are talking only about the mandavi river now there is one more river which is the malprabha river and this malprabha is the tributary of krishna so now all of us know that the northern portions of the karnataka lie in the rain shadow area what is the rain shadow area rain shadow region is basically that particular area which lies in the shadow of the rainfall where the rainfall does not occur because of the presence of the western ghats all the southwest monsoon wearing winds they spill the water on the windward side of these western ghats as soon as the winds crosses these western ghats they become dry and that is why there is no rainfall in the interior portion of the deccan peninsula and that is where the northern karnataka is so in northern karnataka because the region is naturally deficit in water so to so in order to fulfill the water needs karnataka proposed that they will build two dams one is the kalasa dam second is the banduri dam on the tributaries of the mahadai river and with the help of these dams they will transfer the surplus water from the mahadai to the malprabha river so the idea is to transfer the surplus water from the mahadai basin to the malprabha basin that is why they will build first dam that is bandura dam here and the kalasa dam over here on the tributaries 
of the Mahadai River. This is the tributary, Kalsa tributary of the Mahadai River and this is the Banduri tributary. So they will build the dams on these tributaries and with the help of these dams they will transfer the water to the Malprabha river which is again going to Karnataka and with this river the northern Karnataka will meet its basic demands. But then obviously opposition to it came by the state of Goa because Goa is also dependent on this very river to fulfill its needs. However recently as the headline says that central government has given the nod for the Kalasa Banduri drinking water project. So that was all related to this particular Kalasa Banduri drinking water project. And with this, today we conclude our session. All the very best and study hard.